a little ode to Dr. Scott Rosa, mm -hmm. if you would. Hi there, I'm Dr. Kevin Leach here with the Chiropractic Deep Dive Podcast, bringing you the most important research and information on conservative primary spine care, upper cervical chiropractic care, and traditional chiropractic care. These research reviews, interviews, and episodes are made for you, whether you're a medical doctor, patient, or concerned family member or friend. The goal of these shows is to bring awareness of the importance of taking care of our spine and the impact it has on our health and the hundreds of different health conditions it could cause without us realizing it. I'm really trying to bring value with these, so I'd appreciate commenting on the videos, hitting the like button, and sharing them with as many people as you can. You never know who might need to see it. And consider subscribing to the channel so you can see all the other episodes and videos coming out. Thank you so, so much. I truly appreciate your support. Now on to the show. Okay, welcome back, everyone, to the Upper Cervical Chiropractic Research Show. This is episode 27. On behalf of the Council on Upper Cervical Care, I am Dr. Kevin Leach, and here with me once again is Dr. Tyler Evans. How are you, sir? Good, sir. Good to see you. Good to see you. So today's episode is going to be a little bit different. So instead of just reviewing one paper, we're highlighting a researcher in the upper cervical chiropractic world uh, and some of the work and research that he's doing and he's been doing. Um, a little ode to Dr. Scott Rosa, mm -hmm. if you would. Um, so I'm going to let Dr. Evans give a little just synopsis overall on uh, what Dr. Rosa is doing. Uh, and what he's done for the community here. We'll link a lot of his work and a lot of his stuff in the description below so people can, can find it and you know, support, support his work and, and get the information. Um, but Tyler, you were just with him uh, last week uh, in, week Nashville, yep. in Nashville. And uh, I know he presented, you presented also. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I know you sat down and actually uh, talked to him a little bit. Uh, so I'd like you to just kind of tell everybody just a little review, you know, what what he's up to, what he's doing new, what he's published, what, you know, just what, how the conversation went. Yeah. Uh, so uh, just to, to give a little background, Dr. Scott Rosa, he's in New York, um, White Plains, or no, not White Plains, Rock Hill, Rock Hill, New York, um, kind of in the middle of nowhere, if you ever go there. Uh, a beautiful little practice, um, and he's, he sends people for MRIs, upright MRI, phone art, upright MRI. Um, <clears throat> and we could go because we've done a couple of papers before that he's worked on. So the uh, uh, CTE Chiari whiplash paper with uh, Michael Freeman, um, where they described that in a recumbent versus an upright MRI, you see a lot more information on an upright MRI than you see on a recumbent or flat laying down MRI because of gravity. So that paper, I can't remember when that paper came out, 2005, oh, maybe 2008. Yeah, yeah, I'm not sure when it came out, but it was the second episode that we did. So I'll do yeah, I'll link that or I'll put a little tag yeah. for people to see. Perfect. Well. Yeah, so link that one. That's a great paper. But that, so that kind of laid the groundwork. So I think he started doing upright MRI work back in the early 2000s. I can't lay a date on it. But from what my research shows me, I think he started presenting his findings in like 2008 um like consistently um and since then he's been going around and educating chiropractors and other medical professionals on what he's finding with upright mri in gravity in the craniocervical junction and he's actually the one that kind of brought that language into the upper cervical community because when you communicate with a medical professional usually the language they use for the upper cervical spine is the craniocervical junction. And it just happens to be that whenever there's an MRI or a CT scan of the head or the neck, they never get this area or the, there are no protocols. There weren't protocols for this area. There were only protocols for the brain and the skull or the cervical spine. And most of the time, this area got completely missed, which that's a big problem because this is the most neurologically and biomechanically complex joint, if we want to um, uh, reference white and Punjabi, which is one of the greatest uh, texts on the cervical spine. And, you know, when you're looking at a problem in the cervical spine or even in the brain, it's really important to check that joint because it can affect 
everything below and everything above just based on how it's made. So that's his languaging. That's kind of where he comes from. He graduated, I believe, in the 80s from Palmer uh, Chiropractic School and was an intern of, of Dr. Um, Crowder, who was one of the greatest <clears throat> in our profession uh, and really passed down a lot of uh, critical thinking skills to Dr. Rosa. And that's where you know, he kind of uh, uh, got his jump start from, from uh, working with Dr. Crowder back, back then. Uh, you know, and, and just really get digging down and trying to figure out what's going on and, and uh, you know, taking our profession to the next level. So with all that. Uh, well, so, that so that was the, so you, you talked about the CTE paper. Uh, yeah, the and CTE the, paper. And, the domain. And, then, and then, so he developed this relationship with Bonar and Bright MRI, Dr. Uh, Ray Demadian, who, if you go back in the history books, he was the person who invented the um, MRI technology back in the, I believe, early 70s or late 60s. There's a contention between the other two guys that ended up getting the Nobel Prize for it, but Dr. Demadian was the first one to develop the machine. Um, <clears throat> they might have picked up the technology or kind of tangentially uh, developed it, but Ray Demadian is on the map for being one of the first inventors of MRI. And if you talk to him, he was the first. And then uh, he also is the first to invent upright because he knew, and, and uh, you know, he's very aware of anatomy and physiology. He knew that if you put someone upright, you're gonna see a, a different bit of information than if they're laying down. So Dr. Uh, Rosa and Dr. Demadian kind of developed this relationship and Dr. Rosa got the ear of Dr. Demadian and he was able to develop a coil um, and actually, they've done this at a handful of the clinics around the country that have phonar upright machines. And I think there were maybe 10 to 20 of these magnets in upright uh, centers across the country. And they developed a coil that goes around the cervical spine and especially that, that craniocervical junction. They developed a specific technique where they, they do these uh, certain sequences where they really slice really thin and look at just the CCJ because all these techniques before, they weren't really looking at it. So anyways, we got this. Yeah, go ahead. I was going to, well, that was going to be one of my questions kind of, you know, during the episode here was uh, just the, the, the availability of getting these slices and these, these images of the MRI that we're going to talk about in a little bit. Like, how do we, I always wondered how, how he got these images and how he was able yeah. to see which of the ligaments were damaged and you know who's teaching okay. this and where it where can you know upper cervical chiropractors or even other providers get a good education on uh, on, on getting this stuff done i mean I, I can't imagine this wouldn't be invaluable for patients that are in in, in accidents and, and <clears throat> get whiplash injuries for insurance purposes and, and getting reimbursement and getting their getting their injuries actually paid for right exactly and you know, another tangent there, Dr. Croft out in San Diego, you know, Dr. Rosa has kind of taken a lot of his work and then gone to court cases. And this, this MR, MRI technique that they're using, you're able to see tiny ligaments, the ALARs, the, the tectorial membrane, um, some of these tiny little ligaments, and we'll, we'll go through the, the paper here in a second. But, you know, that's where he's been able to show that these tiny little ligaments that hold the craniocervical junction together, and we've done the paper uh, ligaments of the craniocervical junction uh, by Tubbs et al. And that paper, it lays out that there's like 11, but two major, the ALARs. Maybe it's the apical, yeah. I think, that holds it all together. But those, those ligaments are, are really what stabilize the craniocervical junction. And without, without that, that uh, tissue to hold things together, the muscles are the, the next level and then outside of that, there's no bony locks in that area. So that that imaging the soft tissue, which is why the MRI is really helpful, is what is able to allow these people to win cases and show that they were damaged uh, and that they have these long stand, standing issues. Um, and then from all that, he was able to then do post MRI scans where they showed pre and post changes in the ligaments, in the alignment of things, in the fluid flow of the brain, and we can talk about that more. We've talked about the craniospinal hydrodynamics uh, paper by Dr. Flanagan, and basically that the, the skull is a uh, vault of fluid and it's constantly being, fluid's being pushed in and it's got to get out. And if it's not escaping properly, that fluid backs up. 
Dr. Rosa is famous for showing that in these chapters, you know, you can see that the fluid, uh, it then flows post adjustment different than it did before, much better. And that's where people's symptoms start to do better. And so Dr. Rosa is the first person in the chiropractic profession, really in the world, along with the, these other handfuls of doctors. So doc, uh, Dr. John Baird is a uh, chiropractor in Ontario, who Dr. Rosa uh, had helped on this uh, chapter in this book. So in 2015, this book came out, The Craniocervical Syndrome and an MRI. Um, and Francis Smith is a radiologist in uh, London. And then Jay Dworkin, I believe he's a medical doctor that works with um, Phonar in New York with Ray Damadian. <clears throat> so all these people, they all kind of converged. And right around 2015, there was the <clears throat> Craniocervical Syndrome Summit, I believe, or Symposium Symposium. And they all got together. You might have seen videos of this where Dr. Rose is talking, yeah. Dr. Damadian talks. They, they present that paper on MS that we've talked about before in the fluid changes, uh, pre and post adjustment. And so anyways, all this stuff kind of came out of this relationship between Dr. Rosa, Dr. Freeman, Dr. Uh, Damadian, and they had the, this conference in 2015, they produced this book. It's got, uh, what, six chapters, I think, and they're all on different things, but uh, they all kind of approach the craniocervical junction and trauma and what happens to the joints of the spine and what happens to the brain after trauma. Because for a long time, trauma wasn't really looked at unless it was, you know, it's like we've got mild trauma, we've got uh, the, the big trauma, and the big trauma was what they were only looking at. If you had a brain bleed or if you had a crack in your skull, okay, there's a big problem. We need to stabilize it by right. surgery or something like that. Whereas it's the foundational, you know, approach of, of what the, the healthcare system is compared to what we do. So, you know, the medical field is really good for emergency care. They're going to save our lives and we're super yeah. grateful for that. But if they don't find these other things that are going to cause a miserable life experience because of symptoms and, and injuries, then that, that becomes an issue. Exactly. Exactly. And so this is kind of a break from the past where now we're looking at the craniocervical junction as an area that one, uh, you know, is important, right? And so we need to image it properly. So we've got the coil that Dr. Rosa and Dr. Damadian created, and we've got a sequence where we're scanning and looking through that joint. And then on top of it, we're putting all these people together that are radiologists and interventional people like um, Dr. David Harshfield down in Arkansas. Um, you know, he does some intervention where he's doing injections and things with Dr. Rosa. They work back and forth with patients to stabilize the craniocervical junction because that's that's kind of so there's there's what was before 2000, like 10 to 2015 and then what's been after. And what came after is we started talking about stabilizing the craniocervical junction rather than a, like more of a like adjusting language like you know uh, moving bones it's more about stabilizing strengthening the ligaments the tendons the muscles and aligning the joint so that it has the proper structural alignment mm -hmm. um, and it in the book we um, we have the chap first couple of chapters are upright mri of the craniocervical junction that's by dr smith um, francis smith the second chapter is craniocervical syndrome defined and it's basically stabilizing the um the the ccj c1 and c2 by lag screw fixation so it's really fascinating because they they take this really aggressive approach and run screws through the the craniocervical junction to stabilize what we're trying to correct misalignment wise conservatively in a chiropractic approach uh and and they get a very similar result they actually get decrease in migraines or it, like that's the goal right Sometimes in patients, it doesn't work. And now you have screws in your craniocervical junction and you've lost 50% of the range of motion of your cervical spine. Not saying that it doesn't work because for some people it's a lifesaver, but that's the second chapter. And then it's interesting because then it goes into more of a like functional conservative approach, which is what Dr. Rosa does. Talks about concussion and how that changes brain uh, function, the glutamate response and <clears throat> all the chemical reactions there. And then cerebrospinal fluid physiology and its role 
And that's something we've talked about before too, Dr. Uh, Dr. Leach, we've talked about the C CSF and, and its importance and stasis and all that. And you can, you know, you can, you can say that we've done that paper before. Um, and, uh, and then Dr. Rose's paper, um, the craniocervical junction observations regarding the relationship between misalignment, obstruction of C CSF, the cere cerebral tonsillar ectopia, and image guided correction. And he has um, trademarked his image guided corrections with IGAT is the, the trademark there. Um, so we're not saying that, you know, what we do is what Dr. Rosa does, because I've, I've gone and watched him and it's fascinating. He takes an MRI and then he analyzes the soft tissue MRI, whereas like we're analyzing and he does an x-ray analysis, but we're analyzing bone only, which, you know, there might be some difference there. And, and uh, I'm not going to get into that, but, but, um, you know, he does something a little bit different than what we do, but it's still upper cervical care. And, you know, he would say in any of his conferences that, you know, we're, we're doing the same adjustment, he's just got a slightly different analysis, and not same adjustment, but we can see similar changes based on the application that we do with our techniques with NUCA and I do Blair, Dr. Rosa does Atlas Orthogonal. So there's all different techniques within upper cervical, but they all get similar results. And so anyways, that's kind of his approach. And he uses that MRI for his really tough cases. Uh, and he's got some amazing cases and stories. I mean, it's no secret that, um, uh, what was the football player's name? The quarterback from the 1980 Jimmy. Bears. Yeah, Jim McMahon, is that right? Yeah, I always confuse him with the guy that you know, does the, the uh, came to your door and would say, you've won a million dollars, the other McMahon or whatever. But oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Another guy, I forget, I forget that guy. But anyways, um, so Jim McMahon, I mean, he's got a video on 30 for 30 on ESPN that says that, uh, you know, prior to getting adjusted, he'd feel congestion in his brain. Dr. Rosa does his correction and it feels like somebody's flushing the toilet where the fluid's just draining out of his skull. And you can see that in the images. So if you look at the InTech Open chapter that Dr. Rosa uh, created in 2017, I believe, um, that's in a, a book of like, I think it's probably got like 10 or 12 chapters. He's in chapter three and we'll, we'll link that. Yeah. Um, but in that, in that book, it shows it again, it's got the pre and post changes and you literally see the tonsils of the cerebellum, which is the, the lower part of the brain, sagging down into the foramen magnum, which is a hole at the base of the skull. And that tissue then kind of creeps down into that hole by being tugged down by structural uh, tension from the misalignment in the spine. And then when you free that, that fluid is then able to flow in and out of the skull freely and then the, the brain does better because the, the lesions, or the, not the lesions, but the, the toxins in the brain can drain out. Right. And there's a hypothesis that, well, if those toxins drain, the lesions don't build up, right? And then MS, tau proteins, all these things, right? There's new things that are coming out too, where we're talking about, okay, well, there are other things in the cerebrospinal fluid that we need to track that might be precursors to some of these problems too. So there's all kinds of breaking science with that and I can't go into that more, um, but it's uh, it's coming. There are some new things that are coming with that, um, you know, tracking CTE. So uh, cerebellar, cerebellar tonsillar ectopia, ectopia is a structural um, uh, obstruction of the foramen magnum. That's where those cerebellar, cerebellar tonsils come down. And then you have chronic traumatic encephalitis, which is the other CTE that the NFL has gotten itself wrapped up into and has been perpetrating upon its players for the entire existence of the NFL. But now they know about it. And there's a book uh, right over there, League of Denial um, by the F F Fanru brothers, I believe, uh, Mark and I forget the other guy's name, but the Fanru brothers, they were on ESPN and <clears throat> they've got an ESPN show on that. You can get, find it on iTunes. Um, and they talk about how, you know, the, the impacts to the, to the brain, they just build up all this uh, tau protein in the brain. And then if that fluid can get out, the brain can heal. But if that fluid stuck up there, 
um, by the misalignment in the, in the joints in the neck, it backs up and we get all kinds of lesions. So you can see a lot of this stuff in Dr. Rose's chapter in the book, as well as in this paper, the NTech Open paper, which we'll link, uh, I believe the title of the paper is uh, Craniocervical Junction Syndrome, Anatomy of the, the Craniocervical and Atlantoaxial Junctions and the Effect of Misalignment on cerebral spinal fluid or CSO. So, you know, lots of uh, really great pictures and really good information here. And we could talk about this for a week and not get through it all, but you know, you gotta pull up the book, pull up the paper. If you can afford the book, I think the book's, the book's like a hundred dollars. You can get it online at- um, I mean, it's, it well, it's well worth the investment if you're oh, a yeah. cervical chiropractor or even just, you know, have this or a medical doctor or yeah. someone that's interested in finding out more. Um, it's Carger is the book company. Okay. And uh, you can you can pull that up. And then the InTech open paper is free online. You just have to, I think, right. register and download yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I don't want to hog the time here. Do you no, have... this, no, I wanted you to review it, especially because it's fresh in your mind. And you did the, you, you, you know, you were actually with him last week. So uh, yeah. what, so... Uh, would you like to go into the into his his chapter a little bit more? Yeah, um, I mean, I mean, you really went, you really, you did cover the basics, and we have covered it on past episodes uh, yeah. in more detail. Two things that I'd like to talk about. One is with kind of the MRI and his and his analysis. But before we go to there, is he doing any other? Is he doing any other research? Is, does he have any other papers coming out? Like, is he doing anything new? Is he anything there? I don't, I don't know about that. I mean, like I said, there's, he's doing research right now. I can't really talk about it, but okay. um, I know he's uh, kind of secretive about uh, his, he, Well, he's just protective. Yeah. yeah. So he wants to make sure that, you know, it's, it's done properly. And I agree. Right. I think it's great. He's doing something that no one's ever done before in the chiropractic profession. And uh, he doesn't want people to just copy it and say they're doing the Scott Rosa thing. You know, it's like, maybe it's it may very be, different. And maybe Demadian was like, Hey man, <laughs> Don't let yeah. steal it from you. <laughs> no, I think so. Probably. Yeah. Right. Yeah, totally. Right. Definitely talked with them, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, well, I mean, we can show. So I don't want to show images from the book because That's fine. that yeah. is a trademark book. You need to buy the book. Right. And uh, it's fantastic. You can actually go online and, and you might do this, Dr. Leach, link the pre and post. If you just look it up, pre and post CSF flow changes video from Fonar's website. It's okay. on Fonar's website and it's got, it shows that the fluid is not pumping around the brain before the adjustment to the upper neck. And it's a very gentle little correction on the, the back of the you know neck there. And then pre or post adjustment, it's flowing beautifully around the brain with the heartbeat. And we know that that's what pumps the uh, CSF through the skull and through the spine is the heartbeat along with movement and breath. Uh, but the heartbeat has a, has a lot to do with it. So they actually put a pulse oximeter on patients and they'll watch the, the heart rate so that they get the sequence time properly. I mean, it's amazing stuff. Like it's functionally, it's some of the best imaging work next to maybe PET scans that the Amen clinic is doing uh, that's out there. And I, 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 I imagine Dr. Rose will probably at some point get involved with PET scans, but um, maybe not. I don't know. But, um, you know, it's it's just beautiful stuff. And uh, in the magnets for the MRI machine, the phone or MRI machine are actually, they're not the best magnets on the market. I think they're a 1.5 Tesla or a, it's either 1.5 or 3, whether I can't remember if it's higher is better or lower is better, but higher. Um, higher. Yeah. yeah, three, yeah. So, so anyways, the magnets are actually kind of, they're not super weak, but they're weaker than what's now available at like your standard recumbent M MRI. Um, just You're talking about on the phone, for the phone, on the phone are the okay. upright machines, just because it's hard to get a large magnet in an upright situation Got it. and get it to, to do its job. The way that they get the clear images of the neck is by putting that collar on people. And once that collar's on, then it's much easier to see what's going on there because it, it uh, kind of uh, increases the, the frequency or the ability to see the tissue. What, 
Or is this now? I'm, I'm on the phone our site right now. Uh, yeah, it's um, not to be mean, but it's not the most updated and oh no, it's uh, definitely an old user friendly. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm curious what, like, I mean, is this even available <clears throat> for practitioners around the country to to refer to? Like, do they have a list of where yeah. these are? There's a, it, I forget where the list is for, for doctors. And that's, you know, that was always kind of the, the issue is that there's only a few of those upright machines. Um, and there's actually a company in Italy that started making upright machines a, a different way. Uh, I can't remember the name of it. I've researched it before I forget it right now, but the, 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 the magnets, that's the problem with the phone machines. The magnets are weak. So people don't want, they don't want that machine because they don't want to buy a giant magnet and it be weaker, yeah. right? Yeah. And and that's just because you know it takes a lot of money. I I don't want to get I don't want to say something that's going to get me in trouble, but I will say this: that GE, um, they are, or at least the other companies, I'll say this, that make the magnets, they are really good at flooding the market with their machines and not allowing or making it hard on Phonar to bust into the to the market to like you know get machines in areas so um well is know, it is. is the phone are just being used by people like scott rosa and upper cervical chiropractors or is the upright actually being used by other professions as well like what's yeah the, it's being what's used by other professions so like a lot of times they'll use it for disc herniations in the lumbar spine or the thoracic mm -hmm. spine um you know and and that's ca cases of accidents you know that's really helpful like car accidents or workers' comp injuries. And a lot of times it comes down to re reimbursement by insurance companies. That's how the system works, right? So, <clears throat> you know, if you're able to charge a certain fee, you can then reimburse on the on the payment to, to afford to have the magnet, right? So it's, uh, it's a little bit tricky, but um, that's how the world works. And there are machines in New York State, there are machines in, Wa there was a machine in Washington in uh, uh, South Seattle, I forget the name of it, or Bellevue, or south of Bellevue. It was uh, uh, CDI, I think, was the, was the name of the place that had one. Had and, a sonar upright? Yeah, I used to, I, when I was in uh, Kirkland, yeah. I sent patients there. Um, and then I, th I think it's still there. It may be gone. You, you'll you have to look. But uh, it, it wasn't the cone beam CT because you told me about, I went. No, down that was in. That was in a different uh, okay. shop. That, no, the the other places is Florida. So if you're in Florida, there's there's a handful of these down in Florida. Elsewhere, I don't know. I think there's one in San Diego, um, but you just have to call around and do your research and ask if it's an upright MRI. So uh, phone art, the phone art site doesn't have like a list of. I don't think it has a list. I've looked. I've never found the list. Okay. Um, and this the phone art website is old but it's got a lot of great links and a lot of great information on it. Yeah. Um, it's got the link to the MS paper on it. Um, it's got a know, link so to the book too, it looks like. It's got a link to what? To the book. Yeah, to the book. Yeah, it does. Okay. Yeah, and so going online, looking up the book, that's a great place to get some good information. There's also uh, the InTech open paper and those are some great places to look. Cool. Um, a question about the MRI and just the analysis. So as we go through some of the, you know, through the either the chapter, the paper. So the paper in the Intech Open has some really great, uh, and not animations, but just yeah, pictures, they're pictures that are pictures. that are super. The graphics are great. Um, he's also got yeah. some some MRI stuff in there, and then he, you yep. know, he, like just for example, one of them he has, you know, high grade lesions on the alar ligaments bilaterally. Yep. Okay. Um, but when I look at this and I, I've even done some post, you know, a pretty significant amount of postgraduate MRI certification, looking at, you know, disc herniations and things like that, but we've never been, you know, we've never been taught how to, how to look for these things. Right. So is right. there, not only is like the phone, our imaging with the, the collar, the specific collar for the cranial cervical junction, not only is that rare, but I imagine just the analysis and I mean, picking through and, and really looking at those images and figuring out what structures are what, comparing them to normal, you know, like, I don't know, I would, I would actually say, hey, Dr. Rosa, you want to, you want to do a class on that? You know what I mean? Like you want to do like a little, 
continuing education class on on how to how to analyze this you know but that's something yeah something yeah so i mean th that's what the diplomat is right and so oh you guys went over this in the diplomat oh yeah so nice. that's that's where the diplomat really came from nice. uh it was i mean not only there there were a lot of people trying to pull together to make a diplomat but a lot of the information we got was about um radiology mri nice. ct scans and then Good. scott rosa presented i think like three times to our class in in three years and then since then i probably because he comes to the symposium every time uh and so i've heard him present probably more than 10 to 15 times um, and it's always great information to see and, and learn. And a lot of times he'll bring uh, Dr. David Harshfield with him. And David Harshfield is an amazing uh, interventional radiologist where he looks at the tissue, does MRIs, CT scans, x-ray, and then makes judgments based on that. And that's, you know, that's really where <clears throat> this is, is going is it's like we're trying to integrate with medical professionals, not losing our identity, but uh, being able to provide the best care. And Dr. Harshfield says that every time he's like, look, we just all want to get our patients well. And what he would say as a medical doctor is that chiropractors have been right since the beginning, that misalignment of the spine affects the nervous system and the muscles and the ligaments and tendons and the, the, the fluid flow of everything. So yeah. that's a big deal. Um, <clears throat> and yeah. he's a big fan of specific upper cervical work. So and I think he refers to chiropractors like in his area, you know, if there's a problem, he's like, go see the chiropractor, you know, so. Yeah, I think there's a bit of a <laughs> uh, a misguided fear uh, with, with chiropractors that are afraid of us losing our identity or that medical doctors are going to, medical doctors are not going to want to see patients several times a week in the beginning and consist, like they're not going to, they don't, it's not management. They don't want to manage and, and treat like chiropractors do they're doing completely different things they're they're diagnosing they're triaging they're referring out like they're we're not like the only people that are going to lose the profession are the people that are inside our profession that are trying to ruin our profession so it's not the medical doctors like so i completely agree it's it's a working together it's a it's a knowing when the patient needs medical intervention or does not and that's right. that's the that's the huge important thing and obviously you're going to have your diehard chiropractors that are, saying, oh, they never, you know, all you need is the adjustment. Turn that pizza into broccoli, I think. <laughs> was, oh boy, I don't know that one. I think it was, I'm not going to say who I think it was, yeah, but, <clears throat> but uh, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a fine balance and, you know, it, you know, obviously conservative care is the most important first. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So, you know, chiropractic adjustments and, you know, obviously, you know, PT and all these, you know, conservative non-invasive things should be tried first and then you know there should be a protocol there should be a legit protocol an algorithm of of you know patient comes in with x and i mean that's the way it should be that's what the medical field does yeah uh, you know uh, but they just use a different you know toolbox so absolutely yeah um, and, and uh you know just to reiterate i think if someone is interested in this information this book and this paper a really good place to go we'll link it we also have our other podcasts that we've done on the other work that we talked about today that all kind of, you know, goes with it. Uh, and then, the, you know, if you're an upper cervical chiropractor and you want to find out more about this work, if you haven't already, like, listen to Dr. Rosa. Uh, he does present quite often at the symposium that we just had two weeks ago. He'll do that and we'll have that again next year in the summertime. Uh, or the Diplomate program <clears throat> provided by the ICA and the Council on Upper Cervical Care. And that is a uh, you know three-year postgraduate diplomat that uh, we really do this in-depth look at the craniocervical junction, how to communicate that work, and uh, and what Dr. Rose has been doing, and a lot of other chiropractors that are kind of breaking into new uh, parts of the scientific world or medical world, like even through Dr. Schulten's work with uh, uh, the dentist up there that he works with in Calgary. I forget his name right now, but it's escaping me. But um, you know, the dental occlusion stuff is amazing. And Chris Chapman, we, he presented on that the other day at the symposium. So if you're an upper cervical chiropractor, the Council on Upper Cervical Care is where you want to go to find out more about that. Um, 
And uh, yeah, Dr. Rosa, we owe him a, a debt of gratitude for all of the years of staring at pixels on screens and MRIs, uh, because it's really revolutionized. The, we knew that we were making changes. We just didn't know exactly what we were changing and how we were changing it. And he has documented that in cerebrospinal fluid flow, in venous drainage from the brain, arterial flow into the brain, out of the brain as well as alignment. You can actually see it pre and post MRIs. So it's beautiful imaging, check yeah, it out. Yeah, absolutely. Glad you did a little plug for the Diplomate program. Uh, what's, what is, where are they at as far as the class and uh, the yeah. one, or when's the new one start? What's the, what's the update on that? Yeah, no, that's great. Uh, so we are, we're about to finish year two. They should finish uh, by the end of the year. Okay, so we are August 25th, uh, 2021, as we're doing yeah. this podcast, not published, but as we're doing it, as we're speaking. Yeah. We're finishing year two, you said? Yeah, it all depends on things right now. Right. Um, we had to s stop for basically a year, and we yeah. just restarted. So yeah. um, that should be completed, and we should have a graduating class come summer, fall of next year. Okay. And then we'll be starting again the following year in 2023 yes now my math is right yes <laughs> now, now do you how many how many are in that program right now do you know 20, yeah 30? um so we had like 40 people 40. and then this year just zapped people and now how does that compare to the other classes there's been two graduating classes so far my class in 2015, we graduated, I think, 18 people. And the class after that was similar in size. And so at this point, we have, I think, 40 diplomates. Our goal is to have 100 diplomates by the end of uh, the next five years. Got so it. that's our goal. Cool. Yeah. Um, all right. Do you want to, I mean, we didn't really review the papers. Like a lot of the stuff that you reviewed is, well, here's the thing. A lot of stuff you reviewed already with yeah. Scott and all the work that he's doing, that's what, that's what are in these papers, right? So yeah. when we link them in the, you know, in below, you know, we, we encourage you to obviously go find them, anybody listening to these and anybody, you know, that, that thinks you know, that that's interested in, in, in this topic. Um, but it's, uh, yeah. And I mean, is there anything else in regards to, you know, just pointing out anything in these papers specifically that you want to review? We can't really show you the pictures just because they're trademarked and, um, you know, that that's okay. Um, and, and just pick up the paper, like download the paper, the Intech Open paper, that, that is a great kind of synopsis of everything that's been going on. Yeah. And, you know, if you have more questions, uh, don't hesitate to reach out to Dr. Leach or I or any of the other upper cervical chiropractors in the Diplomate program, they all are very familiar with Dr. Rose's work. Um, so I think that's good synopsis. Awesome, awesome. I think that's a good synopsis too. Uh, and once again, thank you, Dr. Scott Rosa. Hope mm -hmm. we uh, hope this podcast did you well. And uh, yeah, <laughs> you can you can email either one of us and yell at yeah. us. If we, uh, <laughs> Please do. <laughs> we need to correct anything but uh yep. yeah thank you again for all your work um yeah anything uh anything else i don't have a fun question for you so unless you don't have unless you have anything else on uh on uh on rose's work then and then we'll call it a we'll call it a day no that's it awesome all right my friend well thank you so much for your time and we'll talk to you soon awesome awesome Okay, that's it for this episode. So what did you learn that fascinated you or surprised you about the research today? Join or start the conversation in the comments below. Hey, thanks so much for watching. To watch more of our research shows, click or tap the screen right there. To subscribe to the channel, click or tap the screen right there. Until next time, I'm Dr. Kevin Leach with the Upper Cervical Chiropractic Research Show, bringing awareness to conservative primary spine care, upper cervical chiropractic care, and traditional chiropractic. Until next time, take care and take care of your spine. It's the only one you'll ever have.